I hope you have your tinfoil hat all made and cinched down tight over your ears. So take it away, Dave and Nick. Welcome to Shiny what? Side Out with Dave and Mickey. Mickey. He's on the reverb today. We're on WCCR <laughs> broadcasting from Australia for Revolution Radio on, you guessed it, www.revolution.radio. Where it's more than just radio, so jump into the chat room. If you can, if you have access to a computer, do it. I recommend it. It's, it, well, it's what the platform is all about. It's an interactive platform. This is show number 364. That's what it is. 360. 460 and 300. 400, 460 100, 100. and 300. 100. It's, it's on air, shows. online. There's a lot of shows. And on your smart device. So grab an app to listen from anywhere or listen at home on a Grace Tabletop digital radio. Hey, Grace, still waiting for that radio. If you missed Solaris's show with Willie Miranda that we're talking about world views and politics well it sounds awesome again it's always awesome Slavis' show is awesome and if you don't know who we're talking about it makes sense then to gain access by subscription to the station's archives for only you guessed it five dollars 95 a month that's a round about a copy a, a, or maybe Maybe it's a triple shot coffee. That's what it costs per month. It's not much. It really isn't much. And, you know, I really, re I, you're doing yourself a dis an injustice by not uh, getting in there because you've got access to not just our shows, not just her shows, but everybody's shows. You can download it and listen to it in your leisure, which is really, isn't that what we do these days? Isn't that a first world thing? We don't have that much leisure time, but we find it when we can. And that's all it, that's all it takes. $5.95 a month. And you know what? You're supporting the station, and that's, that's really what we're asking for here. We acknowledge, that's Mickey and I, Shiny Side Out as a whole, acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land. Where I live, it's the dark and young people, and where Mickey lives, it's the... Daruk, Daruk people, or Darak, uh, depending how you pronounce it. Yeah. <laughs> this is like satellite communications. Uh, well, remember in the olden days when you ring someone, you had to wait, and then, you, <laughs> then you'd both jump in at the same time, you'd both be talking at the same time. It's very over. <laughs> over. Over. <laughs> over, over, never. Under, over, <laughs> Roger. Major, hey. major, yes. Hey, someone's talking pretty bad about Roger, man. All right, so, and pay. We pay hey, our respects to elders past, present, and future, because in the future, when you might be listening to this, we're still paying our respects. And we've done that intentionally. So this, this can be heard in the future. It's not just a now and then. It's a now and then. You know, it's all GFS. This is chronology. This is the temporal prime directive. That you shouldn't change time. Don't do it, it's bad. And let us remember that beneath... Our, all of the things we've made, which is like the houses, all the buildings, the concrete, the roads, everything, are lands which have had stories passed down for, and I estimate around, and it's, it's being generous, sorry, generous in underestimating, about 240,000 generations. Now, when we found the land, we found the land in uh, that had been looked after. They hadn't built all this rubbish on it and dug it up for whatever it was worth and sold it, right? They didn't do any of that. We found lands and in harmony and creatures, you know, in abundance. We found them living in harmony with, with the planet. And if you think what we're doing today is living in harmony, mm -mm. no, no, no. We're, we're about to discard it like a, 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 a single-use plastic container. And move on to another planet. That's what we're about to do as a species. Hi ho. Hi ho. Hi -ho. <laughs> Off to another planet we go. Hi ho, hi ho, hi ho. That, that's Ooh. actually pretty close. See, 
we've we've burnt this planet and one of the things that, that I, I think about is how we have i don't know how people can still keep a job in the media when they're denying climate change i'm not going to say global warming i'm just saying climate change i don't want people to mix my words up because i, I think this is very important for you to understand it's changing it's not a postcard right imagine you went back to it if you could go back in time to a, a 70s you know milk bar or chemist and you bought a postcard which was just some photographer's photo put onto a card that you could make some other people jealous that you went to visit someplace right and you would write in their name and address and say wish you were here and you post it to them <laughs> they're not here I'm here, I'm enjoying it. But that postcard was a photograph. Now, it doesn't look like that today. You know, 50 years on, it's not like that today. That's what climate's like. Climate is changing. The sea level is rising. And where we live, it's getting hotter. It's dumping a whole bunch more snow in other places. That's because there's more moisture in the air. And the moisture, when it encounters cold air has to dump as snow where we live we oh that sounds pretty crazy dude. crazy that man. sounds like crazy talk over right there hey hang on i'm not learning something am i <laughs> right? so, so this, this is really hard so, so, so we used to have summer in the season of summer that's when summer was summer wasn't march because that's autumn to us or fall if you're in the us because we just we had 40 records across australia in temperature temperature high temperature records broken in the first two days of this autumn so the the temperatures that we're talking about are very hot indeed so Hobart have you ever if you've ever looked at the map of Australia that tiny little island which is the last place that you leave from if you're going to go to the Antarctic station <laughs> it's the closest island to the Antarctic uh, that we've got in Australia anyway and that island reached 39 degrees in the capital city and the little Cape Cape Bruni that's all it's called Cape Bruni it later on in the afternoon reached 39.7 that's the almost the southerly tip of the island the island closest to the antarctic uh continent right 39.7 in autumn now all right so remember that the client the climate is changing and what it's doing is it's warming and making summer longer it's making the transition quicker to a very shallow low temperatures of winter where we live in australia i can't express that enough if you've got if you're landlocked pretty much to the arctic circle you're going to experience the cooling air coming out of there widening like the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn and the equator that, you know, it straddles. The, the weather used to be in these strips and they were predictable. And now we're seeing things that aren't predictable in the climate. Now, I want to keep rabbiting on about climate refugees. We're going to see those and we're seeing them already. We're seeing people evicted from islands because the island doesn't exist anymore. It's underwater. We're seeing sea level rise. And all I am totally disappointed about i'm just wrap it back again to the beginning I'm going to join these two links together and i was watching an australian news program paid journalists on the news talking about the next cooling period which is a dead cert in court according to him and he's not a meteorologist he's just someone who calls lefties losers now i'm not going to say the right wing and left wing are the same as what you you might experience in the us they're not they're different kinds of right and left there is always a right and left because it's depending on the angle you're looking at them 
perpendicular to where they're separated apart from each other, but they don't represent the same things in Australia as they do in the US. Then let's just put it that way. And the people on the left here don't share the same left views that the people in the US have, and likewise with the right. But all I can say is, this guy is a climate denier. He doesn't believe there's climate changing at all. He just says, thinks it's all cyclical and he's happy. But in his argument, and this is the funny thing, he decided to use the argument to disprove it's getting hotter by saying that the people are modifying the, uh, the historical records, let's put it that way, by saying, well, well, this chunk here, we didn't want that, so we're going to take it out. And for that chunk there, whatever highs it had in there, now they're disregarded. And we're, now anytime we have a high and it, it didn't beat one of those, but it's because those ones don't exist, now it's a new record. He is so wrong, it's not funny. There are weather stations that weren't recording through periods of time, but those periods of time are, are purely disregarded because the weather station wasn't active. And Australia's pretty big, so that we didn't have people everywhere all the time. And some, some just didn't record any temperatures. But those that did had a continual record and they're not fudged, they're not added to. But globally, there are some places where what they did was take the, the, the average for that period and just averaged it through it because there wasn't any telemetry coming from them. And they had to do that for modeling purposes so that they had some data to work on. But that isn't what everyone is using to gather their information. And certainly this guy was a complete, I don't, can't say the word on air, uh, for standing up and telling everyone his point of view as a paid journalist on television <laughs> affecting an amazing amount of people. But remember, they only watch him because they share his views anyway. And I have to say, I'm quite disappointed in that. And we're coming up to an election and those people that watch his show are going to probably vote for the current party that's in because they the first task when they got in, like, what is it, six years ago, was to delete any government department that had word climate mm -hmm. in the title. And they're, they're puppets to big coal. And I'll say that's what I think they are. And I'm really I'm truly disappointed that, that anyone today, and this is that thing, do you want it to be you on your watch that in, in the history books of the future, when we're all living on Mars, because the Earth is too hot to, to live on, that you can say you were the idiot that didn't, you you, do, you 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 failed to act. Can, I, I'm just basically history is going to blame you because you did nothing when you could have done it, right? Because doing something doesn't doesn't ruin it for everybody. It just means you gave it a shot. Oh. Right? Does that make sense? It, you know, I I know that people people in management you, is it's very important to make a decision even if you're wrong, but you should always review the, uh, the information coming to you so you can make an informed one. And I know that the current sitting party in Australian politics orchestrated a paper in which they themselves were given information from their own people that said the climate is changing so severely and the sea levels are rising. We really need to do something about this now and not wait, you know, a hundred years. And they go, oh, a hundred years. Wow, cool. Well, we've got heaps then. <laughs> and they, they took from the headline that it'll be terrible in a hundred years. So they go, well, we've got so long to wait. That's not even in our voting cycle. So we'll just do it some other, some other voting time. And that was what, 20 years ago with, with uh, Howard. And I'm just, I'm really disappointed. It's terrible. So we're living in a place now where if we had have acted sooner, we'd probably be, probably be in better stead. They're going to spray us with chemicals because they want to, they're saying we can spray the upper atmosphere to reflect the sun's rays away. That's probably what's already been going on for 30 years or more. And where are we going to be? Is it going to make it cooler or are they just going to make it worse?
and they're going to make it worse by now polluting the planet with more things. Now, I know I've been ranting. I'm going to hand the floor to Mechie. It's been at almost a whole 20 minutes, like at least 15 minutes, because it starts at, what, 4.55 seconds, so. Uh, mm. Mechie, I'm sorry to have to put you into it, but, you know, I know we've talked about this a, long, a lot, and it's it's right up my alley, and before I go on to another topic, I, I want to open the floor to you, if, you, if you're willing. <laughs> I just got uh, back from wishing in my roof, just in time, right? So, here we are. Uh, <laughs> and look, I, I, don't, I don't disagree, and there is a lot of um, action yet taken, but again, it all depends on how real you think all of this is, right? I mean, is this really all real? Is it uh, some kind of <laughs> holographic, um, you know, experiment? Is it uh, something else? Uh, I, I obviously, it's really a hypothesis, have my own opinion. Having said that, it, even if this were uh, an illusion, uh, you know, some kind of uh, simulation, you, we still are accountable for our actions. Uh, all philosophies agree on that. It's irrelevant if it is, uh, if it is a, a real reality or a lesser reality. Uh, you know, like uh, this is what the Gnostics call the, the gross meta-reality. Um, whereas, uh, you know, um, the higher and the subtler matter is, is uh, some frequencies above us. And it still matters what we do here. It still matters uh, how we treat ourselves, the planet, and nobody would disagree with that. I think it is uh, paramount that we take action. Uh, you can sit there and say, oh, there have always been crazy weather events. That's cool. Um, you know, um, <laughs> and um, it's, it's really important that that we understand that these crazy weather events are now the norm. It's not a new normal. I've said this before, right? You can call it crazy or extreme weather when it happens once in a while, when you've got a once in a hundred year flood three times a week, or you know when you have temperature records broken every week, every day almost since records began. You you, you have to ask yourself, hey, hang on, that's uh, this this once in a lifetime event. Is happening every day. Hmm. hmm. Let's 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 think about that for a little bit. And, and the unfortunate truth is, this Dave is right. In Australia, our, our uh, ruling party is so oh, not the party itself. Are uh, in the back pocket of the coal industry specifically. And again, I mean that's that's how that's reality. That's how it works. It's real. We, 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 we're not children. We understand how it works in, in the world. We understand business. We understand politics, right? Anybody who thinks politicians want to do you uh, a solid, you know, and, and do the right thing, I'm sorry. You really have to go back to your history books and, <laughs> and do a real quick study. Uh, but uh, th there are a couple of things I wanted to share with you um, while I have you here on, on the mic as well. Two things. One, uh, we spoke about sliding. Uh, last week, um, Solaris had posted some excellent links. Uh, essentially, what this is is the switching of, of streetlights. Uh, other mm. things as well, but mostly mostly streetlights. So, point in case, because I went for a run, um, I want to say Tuesday night, could be Wednesday night, I can't remember, but I go at night because uh, there's less traffic, the, the air's cleaner, and uh, I mean, in, in, here in Wild, if it's pretty safe, so it's, it's all good. I've got a little flashlight carrying my keychain so I can see where I'm going. Uh, but anyway, so I was running, and there's this one street that it always uh, it goes off when I go you know, near it or pass under it or whatever. Or it goes on. So the effect goes both ways. It's interesting, right? If it's off, it actually turns on when I get near it. So I was looking for that. So I was running, you know, I was still pretty, you know, pretty energetic and you know, jogging along. And, and I, 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 um, I looked at it, and there it is. It's coming up. Yeah, it's on. Okay, case so it's going to go off. Nothing happened. It's, it, it stayed on. It stayed on. Um, okay. Oh, well, whatever. So I kept running. And I do, it's, it's around a little lake here that I run, right? So it's a, probably about two and a half, three kilometer, kilometers around the lake. Nice that's, run. That's there. roughly what it is. Yeah, it's good, right? So I do it twice and then I go back home. So this is now I come around for the second time and I'm not as sprightly as I was when I first started. <laughs> okay, so my, my step is not as energetic and I don't, I don't really think about anything but putting one foot in front of the other. <laughs> uh, up comes the light and I'm completely oblivious to it and bang, off it goes. Okay, so at the point 
that this, this sliding phenomenon makes specifically is that you can't control it, all right? And most of the time it happens, um, uh, you know, um, when you're not focused on it. Uh, in, in fact, uh, or you might be in a, in a slightly um, high, heightened state emotionally when you affect uh, these, these uh, devices. But for me, I can certainly say that when I focused on it and, and I waited for something, it didn't happen. Um, but I didn't, and because I was too exhausted to think about it, it, it promptly turned off. Now, having said that, in the past, when I had thought about it, it did turn off uh, as well. So it, it, is, it is not a phenomenon that is following any pattern, per se. But I know that when I try to do it, I can't. There's just nothing I'm, I'm doing to make it happen, if you know what I mean. Right? I mean, it's just like looking at the light switch, but not actually, you know, using your finger to turn it on or off. You know that's what you should do, but but you know you're not doing it. And but guess what? The light is not turning on or off because you're not hitting the light switch. Except I don't know how to turn on or off that particular light switch, right? So it's it's there's nothing that you can actively do. So that's interesting. Just a point in case as to what happens there. Secondly, I um <laughs> I watched a documentary the other day. Uh oh. Uh, uh, Behind the curve, I think it's called, and um. And it was about the flat Earth, essentially. Right? Flat Earth is uh, Ma Ma Strange, Ma Ma Matt Strange. What was his name? Is Mark Strange? Oh, come on, something Mark. And anyway, anyway, it doesn't matter. And and I, I watched it, and in, in the entire thing, there's, there's not no pro or con. Like it doesn't actually say whether or not there's evidence for or against it. Right? It's just like a documentary. Like there wasn't. It was just, I guess, a general interest piece because there's there's so many you know adherents to it now. There. You know, 50,000 members in the Flat Earth Society, things like that. You know, millions of hits if you Google it. And then I was thinking, I was talking to someone as well, I was thinking, we had a show cycle on this. I think it was two or three show cycles, about six hours worth of material. And we, we go through it. We go through it. And, um, and in all that time that we went through it and since, no one has come to us and said, you're wrong. Because we said the Earth is round. That's what we're saying. The Earth is round. Mm hmm uh, it can be proven mathematically. It was, it was proven mathematically 2,000 years before we ever went into space by uh, measuring the length of shadows in different That's parts correct. of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to understand that we talk about scale here, and people have a really hard time. And I, I feel compelled to say it again because there are so many people believing this to be a thing. Um, uh, it's it's, it's scale. Yeah, well, it's it's scale. People, a billiard is my favorite example. You, everybody knows a billiard ball, right? <laughs> or, or, or snooker ball, it doesn't really matter, right? It's a mm -hmm. little little ball, you know, about or the size pool. of a tennis ball. If you play pool. Or pool, yeah. Bingo, right? And, and it, I don't care what color, the black one, the white one, the, the purple one, the, it doesn't matter, any, any one of those. T pick it up. I right? pick it up and look at it. It looks pretty smooth, right? It looks pretty smooth. And it is, it's pretty smooth. If you were to blow it up to the size of the earth, if you did little, you know, little uh, mm -hmm. billiard ball, if you blew, blew it up to the size of the earth, the mountain ranges on it mm -hmm. and the canyons on it would be both higher and deeper than anything that we have on earth. That's true. So that should give you some idea about the scale that we're talking about here, right? So the, the earth will appear flat. If you're standing in a big salt plane, it will be completely flat, right? It will. It just, it's just how it is. Um, but if you were really, really big, right? If you were like a large human being, you know, maybe a kilometer in height and, and you know, all the other measurements uh, similarly enlarged, you could see that the Earth was actually curving. Okay, there'd be curvature to the Earth. But we are just tiny, 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 insignificant little ants. If you look down on your, at, at your feet, at tiny little ants scurrying about doing their thing, right? That's us on, on the Earth. Like between, there's no much difference between us and the ants, size-wise. I know it, it looks like there's a massive difference, but in reality, there's very little difference between us and the ants. We are but ants. On the surface of the earth truly truly just ants so that's that's a problem now there are other things as well we've discussed uh, i like uh, to think of the seasons as one thing how do the seasons work on the flat earth 
And the answer I got was, well, the sun magically jumps orbit. Well, it wouldn't mm. be an orbit. It would be whatever you call it. I don't Some know kind of rotation. But, yeah. Yeah, it, it, yeah the, the rotational period would... Well, it's not, yeah, it's, yeah, I guess it's a, it's a rotation, overhead rotation, I guess. It jumps. It goes out, it goes in. It goes out, it goes in. That makes absolutely no sense at all. And show I'll tell me, you why. Show me a clockwork model of it and I'll... Yeah. Yeah, see what exactly. Happens. Hmm. It, it just doesn't. I'm sorry. This, the seasons kill the flat Earth, unless you say magically God made it so. But at which point, I have nothing left to say. I, got, I told you before we had a, this, this interesting discussion on the train many years ago with, with a couple of guys, and when it came to the dinosaurs, I said, "Well, they're pretty old, you know. I mean, you know, hundreds of six, you know, tens of millions of years, and some of it." Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's not true. I said, oh, okay, oh, okay, that's not true. Fair, fair enough. Okay, um, I know that you know radiocarbon dating is controversial. It's not as accurate as we'd like it to be, but still, we understand how it works. There's radioactive decay in particles, and and we can we can estimate you know um, how much time has passed, and maybe uh, uh, you know radioactivity, and you know so so we have some understanding. There are other particles that we measure now, and I was completely wasted. I wasted my breath. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's all not true. Um, okay, so 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 how is it then that these dinosaur, you know, fossils and such, not just dinosaurs, but dinosaurs specifically, are so old? Or we think they're so old. Well, God made them so. God made them so. God made them 65 million years old. And at that point, um, there's really nothing else you can say because you win every argument. It's magical thinking, right? If you if you have magic, and it's great, it's awesome because you know mm -hmm. that's how I win everything. It's just like the witch trial. This is which this witch uh, uh, guitar, it, you put the witch on on a on a on a beam in the water on the beam, and you you weigh it down right and um, and then the witch is dunked into the water so that's it's like a think of it like a scale system right like a like a set of scales and so she's in the water and then you you pull her up again right so if she if she drowns <laughs> she was a good woman or a good man as it were right because men were also burned as witches. Um, so they were, they, they were innocent if they drown. If they live, if they live, they are witches and you must burn them. So <laughs> you're asking yourself, oh, what, 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 how do I win in that scenario? It's, it's, it's not, you can, there's no win scenario here. You can, that, but it's not the point. It's, the point was to kill the person. It, it, irrespective of whether or not they're a witch or not, the, the end result is they're dead. So it was never about finding a witch. It's about killing that person. Irrespective of whether they're rich or not, you know. So it, it's it's a bit like that. You already know the outcome. Everything else is just hot air, right? Oh no, God made everything the way it is. Okay, end of discussion. We we have nothing to talk anymore. There's really no more. <laughs> it is now just a waste of breath. You know, you can you can do something else. Plant an apple tree. Why not? Go ahead and plant an apple tree. Do something useful with your time. Um, but yeah, so Dave, these are the things that bothered me. Um, they go ahead. You hang on, I've got something to add to it. So, I was I was I went into the local store, and the, and the fellow behind the counter said, "So, uh, so how's the flat Earth going?" And I, he goes, "You follow that, don't you?" And I said, "Well, I I don't believe it that the Earth is flat," and he says, "Why?" I said, well, there's two things, two things that are, that prove it is, is false. And I said, the Coriolis effect. And he goes, oh, that one, right? Rolling his eyes. Like that wasn't going to shake him from his pedestal. And I said, well, well, how about this one? So if you look into the skies in the Northern hemisphere, the looking up at the center star, the North Star, you'll notice that everything revolves in a certain direction around that star. So fly to the Southern Hemisphere and you'll notice a counter rotation. Although we don't have a star placed at our polar, um, at our center of our rotation, but we, we observe everything. When we look up, we see it going in a clockwise direction, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, you see it going in the anti-clockwise direction. He goes, so? And I said, well, okay, so if you're on a disc that's rotating around a center point, how can the sky have two counter-rotating poles in the sky? Just, just tell me that. 
And he goes, what? And I said, well, the example I just gave you is two counter-rotating points in the sky. It would look, look like looking um, up at the, you know, the blades of a, of a hand mixer. <laughs> How is that even possible? And I want to see, and I said, if you can do it, make a, make a model of it and how it works, right? And I, I might begin listening to you. Because this is, this is the mentality, right? Just because I saw some YouTube videos, I'm on board. I don't think of the complicated mathematics around its impossibility, but that's okay. Because I bleat like a sheep. I'm a sheep. <laughs> I can't do it. Maggie, I just can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. Can't do it. Can't listen to them. And they don't want to listen to me trying to explain that it's not real. Oh, but that's they didn't talk about that in the video. Well, why don't you make your own video where you talk about it and try to explain it then? Good on you. <laughs> right? Make the model of it work and show me. I'm just treat me like the church in the Galileo times. The earth was the center of the entire universe. Of course, that's not right, but why not? Why not? If you can make a model that proves that's right and then explain how everything else works, especially Mars, how it stops and starts again, right? Goes back on itself. That's fine. Well, the but other... that's that's the that's that's the thing though, Dave. This is this is this is how far this is what you have to understand, everybody. And I don't want to really waste any more time on this, but <laughs> it's I no, but it's it's important because it's it's, it's actually growing as a movement. It's growing I massively. Know. Okay, and and uh, it's it's actually sucking on people that you normally wouldn't think that would be sucked in. But but the point here is this: sorry, they'll, um, they'll all be left that behind part. when the aliens come to take the intelligent people away, right? S well, they are no aliens; they're, 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 they're <laughs> demons from hell. No, they are. But you know, this is yeah. crazy. So yeah, yeah, that's that's it. So, but the thing is, is it, it does go back that far because the geocentric model of the world is what everybody <clears throat> wanted it to be. That's what the church said it was because we are special. Like God, God created the earth, and then we are the center of the universe, and, and that's what the flat earthers believe as well. At least a large chunk of them. That <clears throat> in fact, it does go back that far. It goes back hundreds of years. Conspiracy that we are living on a flat earth, and, mm -hmm. and Galileo and Kepler, you know, they're all in league with whoever is trying to control us. Every astrophysicist, every astronomer, every uh, person uh, you know employed by NASA. And I'm not not saying NASA is not keeping secrets. I, like, I, I know they are, right? And they're not telling us everything there is to know. I get it, right? But the biggest thing that the um, Earth is flat um, is is. I mean, okay, I haven't been to outer space. I've flown though. I've flown on planes. Yeah, um, I do observe the moon uh, as well. Um, Jose Escamilla made a great, uh, actually a couple of great documentaries uh, about the moon. If you, if you get a chance to Rest check it place. out, please do. He, uh, he's no longer with us, but there's just a whole bunch of stuff. And I've been very high up in the world, in high mountain ranges, you know, where you can see a curvature happening. The Eiffel Mountains, for example, I've been there. Um, and it's, it's just hard, especially when you're flying, you can see it. I mean, if you're in a plane, you, you get an inkling. Of, of what it all looks like. This is the planet, right? Um, if, if the Earth were flat, if the Earth were flat, it would be the most astounding secret to have been kept for these past few hundred years. And all our math is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all, all I know it is, it's wrong. Uh, all, all these rockets we, we clearly didn't send up. And I've, I've actually gone to, to Florida uh, and, and I went to the, um, to the space center there. Mm -hmm. And I saw it all. Saw the launch platforms. Unfortunately, when I was there, there was no launch. But you know, you can't have everything. It, all of that is is it's put on as a show for us. <laughs> like, okay, it would have been a lot easier just to keep us dumb and never educate us, right? Like they did for hundreds of years before that. Mm -hmm. it, it just um, look. Let me let me put it this way. It just doesn't make any sense to perpetuate this conspiracy or this cover up or this secret. I mean, if somebody can explain to me why the Earth was made into round rather than flat. So the, the lie is that it's round, right? So, okay, the truth is flat. What's the difference? Um, you know, oh, because then, you know, God, we can, we can deny God. 
people will deny God anyway. And there are people that believe in God today, whether or not the earth is round or flat. Okay, that argument doesn't hold. Oh, well, you know, but if, you, if, you, if the earth were flat, then we would be special and we'd be, you know, the, we're the center of the universe. Well, just by the earth being flat doesn't mean we're the center of the universe. Okay? So there's a lot of false reasoning in this whole thing which just hurts my head. Okay? Uh -huh. If you make a coherent... If you make a coherent argument, okay, I'll follow it as far as I can, and we might disagree. That's cool. Mm -hmm. That's cool. But at least make a coherent argument, and don't just give me that. Because I saw that in the I saw that that look on the on the face of these people. Like, yeah, you're an idiot. You know, clearly you don't know what you're talking about. I know everything. That's the kind of look, right? That's yeah. the same look That's I get from one. from people that don't believe any of the stuff I say, which is fine. You don't have to believe, but you look should be like an idiot. I've yeah. thought about. Mickey and I stuff, are both right? trained. We're both trained. <laughs> And well versed in that look. Oh yes, we've experienced yeah. it for That's some time. Look. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Look, uh, it, it is. It is what it is, and, and you, you can't help people. You know, you look. You can You really can't, right? So what do we do? We 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 grin and bear it, and we try to shine a light. If somebody comes and says, "Hey, wrong." You got it wrong, Mackie and Dave. The Earth is flat, and here's proof positive. Why? This is my challenge to flat earthers everywhere. Here's my challenge: just fifty thousand of you. Everybody put a hundred bucks in, and you build a rocket, and you put a satellite up there, taking a picture of the flat Earth surrounded by a two hundred and two hundred foot ice wall, or whatever the hell it is, whatever sure. we think it is. Sure. Put a put a satellite into space, flat earthers. Do it, because there's enough of you. You can raise the cash and take a picture from space. Hey, maybe your rocket is going to hit the dome that you think there is. Mm. Even better. It'll crack It'll crack the dome, right? Like Hunger so Games. Just, so, yeah, just like it. So that's my challenge to you. Put your money where your mouth is, all right? Put together. A, these days you can. It's free enterprise world. There are lots of private rockets being shot up all the time. By the way, what are satellite communications? They're being put into orbit, <laughs> not into a circular rotational thing that we have on a flat Earth. But anyway, it doesn't matter, whatever. And uh, line of sight, you heard about Sometimes we can't talk to satellites because they're on the other side of the planet. Oh, hang on, that, it's impossible on a flat Earth. That's oh, no, Mickey, you don't understand. It's all, sat satellites are all lies. <laughs> they're not satellites. So, That's Mickey, crazy. Mickey, there, there was a, um, a ship that they want to hire out so they can cruise around on the flat earth do it yeah maybe you fall off the edge fall off the edge go for well they're gonna, they're gonna the go to the ice wall you see that's around the entire perimeter yes. of course they won't Please do they won't experience the ice wall around the entire perimeter they'll just circumnavigate the planet because yeah. hey, look look i i know nighthawk is probably hating us right now because this this is the honestly the stupidest or sorry most stupid that's proper that was perfectly cromulent it's the most stupid topic that anyone could argue for honestly and it, it drives me nuts I, just, I wanted to just wrestle the mic off you for a minute and i need to talk about india and pakistan uh, yes i was watching this week there was a plane shot down that was in response to a uh, a Pakistani killing an Indian who then India got back at them and bombed a training depot or something like that and then they were able to take the plane down they they were having tea with the pilot apparently when I looked at the plane I, I was looking at that going mm, no one survived that crash and then they're, they're supposedly having tea with this guy, and then they're dragging his, his dead carcass around. So, like, they, they've got their own issues together. And I know it's about Kashmir. And I know China's waiting, because it's a little... It's it's the keystone between all of their their lands. And one of the, the things is, this is a long-held grief about this territory. But Pakistan's viewpoint is so extreme that they would and they've their military leader was there and i watched it on the interview on rt i was very interested to see how bad this could go 
And one, one of the things was that the military leader from Pakistan said that he's well aware of mutually assured destruction and would be completely happy to acknowledge that if they were pressed into a corner, that they would unequivocally decide to launch everything they had at India, knowing full well that they, mm -hmm. they themselves would be completely destroyed. But they said, we're not going out, leaving them still alive. Mm -hmm. that's, how, that's how deep this hatred is. And I just want everyone to know that. That this is currently a hot spot on the planet. It's not like poor little Yemen that's getting bombed out of existence by Saudi Arabia with both US weapons and, you know, the, the Allies' what? weapons. It isn't that. What it is, is this long-seated hatred between each other, and we're, we're seeing some of the... Um, what, what the background to this is. Now, should this get into waiting what's that what, what's it i made a mistake still waiting on the emergency airtime reason to cut a live broadcast <laughs> um so what i'm what i'm really concerned about is and mecky i'll give you a comment on this in a second and, and that was the, the hard part to me was to see their anger we know they're both nuclear powers and they have nuclear weapons, and if they're willing to use them, then that's something that I think is quite a concern. And how does that affect the rest of the world? Well, you know, we'd have radioactive isotopes floating around the air, more than we have now. If they didn't exist, I my thoughts are China would probably want to come in and repopulate India as quickly as possible. I believe that would happen. I, I could totally believe that would happen. They'd do a land grab for it, because who else would fight them? No one, right? So, would it escalate to a global? Maybe not. Mackie, what are your thoughts? Oh, look, uh, we, we had this, um, we had this uh, little, um, you know, discussion earlier during the week. Um, a, a local, a regional nuclear exchange is a definite possibility. Um, I wouldn't put it past them, because the funny thing is this, it used to be one country until 1947, I think. Um, and then it, I think it was 47, could have been 46, uh, don't nail me down on that, but the point is it was one country, and then it was partitioned um, and the British got uh, the crank out of there, just like in Israel, which was Palestine at the time. But the point is it's, it's, it's uh, the same people. They are the same people. They're not Pakistani people or Indian people that are ethnically different, like one is blonde hair, the other one is black. Not like that. They're the same ethnicity, they're the same race of people. One is Muslim, the other is largely Hindu. Having said that, even though Pakistan has got some three or four hundred million, I think it's three hundred million um, citizens, <clears throat> there are still more Muslims in India, mm -hmm. with one point four billion people living there. So there are more Muslims in India than there are in Pakistan, and they're all the same people. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying all Indians are the same. Of course, there are regional variations, you know, from north to south, and you know, different dialects and all that. But ethnically speaking, the Indians and in Pakistan, sorry, the Pakistanis and in Pakistan, the Indians in India, all come from the same stock. So, and they've only been separated for for um, a few decades, not longer. Um, you're right about China. I believe the China could could come and um, if there was something to happen. They could uh, snag some of the um, <clears throat> disputed territories. And India and China have, been, have yeah, absolutely. Look, China and India have been at war. <clears throat> well, not officially, but there have been skirmishes along the border. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, it's the Himalayas between them, but um, nothing uh, that uh, uh, can stop a determined Chinese or even Indian force. And then, of course, you've got Israel. And make no mistake, um, the Middle East is just around the corner from from this. It's it's just across the Kaaba Pass. And you're um, you're in the Middle East, so that's just another consideration. In, in the in the general confusion, in the fog of war, as it were, um, Israel might take advantage of the situation. The Arab states might take advantage of the confusion. I mean, who knows, right? Uh, it's it's not a good situation, uh, not not a world war trigger, in my opinion, mm -hmm. uh, because it just doesn't. I mean, how can I put this best? There just isn't. 
enough upside in it. Like the, the, the numbers don't make sense, right? The angles don't work out. You know, if, if you're in the con game or if you're, if you're looking at the angles, it just don't make sense, right? It just uh, the, the, the numbers don't add up for anyone to do any more than, than we have. As if you, unless you're looking for a trigger point. If you're looking for a trigger point, perfect. But you've got so many trigger points. And we've we had so many in the past. We, they all passed up. Better trigger points than this. That's a good point. Uh, that we had so know, many in the past that we gave up. Mecky, the, the thing is that, that there are certainly some benefits from losing uh, India, and that is the, the call centers. They probably return back <laughs> to uh, on, on prem call centers, right? That's it's very cold. So, that's cold. Right? But at least, we, at least we won't get those the scammers that are calling us, you know, so that we can yeah, pay them in true. Apple. True. Apple cards, right? Apple yeah. store cards. Yeah, no, 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 no argument. Yeah, so, no so, argument for me, so but the IT but security is... industry are going to be really appreciating that. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Uh, look, yes, uh, there's that. Um, but having said that, uh, labor arbitrage, which which means uh, moving your high cost workforce to a low cost uh, workforce in another country, that is dead. Labor arbitrage is pretty much dead. What is uh, alive and well is now automation. So people are no longer interested to uh, send work into cheaper cost centers. I mean, smaller companies still are, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, what you really want to do these days is you want to automate yeah, whatever automate you the can. Way right? mm -hmm. so, so, so no people, I don't care how cheap they are, right? We don't want to pay anyone. And that's 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 the um, that's the and dream you, nirvana. You can certainly, or of, you can capital CEOs. It is. It's the nirvana. You can you can certainly capitalize on, uh, and, and that's uh, the irony in the word capitalize. You can capitalize on automation to reduce staffing costs. Absolutely. Um, Mackie uh, Nighthawk, the station owner, I'm just going to put this out there, um, reminded both of us that don't worry about the flat earthers. They don't even believe Australia exists. <laughs> So I know. So I just saw the chat. Night, 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 you're correct. I, I saw these memes on Facebook saying that Australia clearly is a made-up continent. And you look at the names and the animals. I mean, platypus. That can't be a real animal. Kangaroo. Really? Come on. That's crazy. And the names. Wulumulu. Parramatta. Those aren't real names. That's not a place. That's insane. Um, I, I can tell you out there. Okay, yes, yes, I am a CIA shill. I work for the NSA. <laughs> I'm sitting in a bunker in Montana right now. Okay, I'm pretending to be in Australia, which doesn't exist, by the way, clearly, because, you know, it's, it's past the wall, you know, the, which we which we build around the earth, which is flat. The firmament. I know, so it's, it's, more, right. it's, more con it's more concave than flat, but still, it doesn't matter, right? Um, <laughs> but that's what they Hey, you know what? I'd love to sit in a bunker in Montana. You know what? I'm not. I'm not sitting in a bunker in Montana. Oh, I'm in S4. That's all right. Do you know, Mickey, we, we should start a new movement, the Concave Earth. The Concave Earth. Why not? <laughs> you, know, you know what? I'm going to... No, no, no. We, we can do better than that. <laughs> oh. I'm thinking a Möbius, a Möbius Strip Earth. Maybe a Möbius Strip. You remember that, that, that uh, swills on itself? That's right. Or Donut Earth. I like donut. Yeah, I like to play Age of Empire, not Age of um, Civilization. You know Civilization. Yeah, I know. Civ, uh, yeah. I, used, I used to play that as I well. I love, love Civ. Love it. Love it. Still play it when I can. You know, I've got a minute here and there. But I love the game, right? And that that it's usually it's usually either a like a like a toroid. It could be a donut world as well. Very very rarely is it actually a sphere. Mm -hmm. um, but hey, I, I think we I think we're living on on a, on a, on a toroid or or like I said, a Möbius strip. I'm gonna start. <laughs> it's okay. Nighthawk. Here it is. I'm going to start a Facebook page called yeah. the Möbius Strip Earth. <laughs> I want to see how many morons I can make fall me. I don't know. It's my, you know what? That's my, my social experiment for this year. Because this is high strangeness. This is the shiny right. side out. It sure is. Of high strangeness. Okay? 2019. High strangeness. I'm, I'm 50 years old this year. This is my midlife crisis. I'm going to start the Möbius Strip Earth. World, because everything is, is makes sense. They got time travel and you know disappearances and all kinds yeah. of things, man. It's a I'm walking into yesterday. I'll give you that. Well, you better believe it. Yeah. So that's what I'm doing. Flat Earth. I still don't know what's happening. <laughs> it's not a flat Earth. It's the Mervius Strip Earth. Yeah, Mervius Strip. Here we go. That's gonna happen. You watch out. It's gonna happen. I'm doing it. Done. <laughs>
Oh mercy! I'm. Uh, that's <laughs> that's so funny. I have to do the, the no. I have to do the convex Earth. That's what I have to do. That's the reason. You should. It solves all the problems with the flat Earth. <laughs> all all the, the convex problems. shape. Yep. <laughs> that's why you, you can't see anything because it's convex. Yeah. So anyway. Uh, yeah. Um. Well, look, we're we're right at the top of the hour. Breaks about to start, and I'd just like to remind everyone yeah. that this is there. It is. This is listener funded radio. So take the opportunity during the break to donate to the station or subscribe to the archives. Get yourself on board, and we'll see you after this short, very short station break. <laughs> Um, we are we endorse everything else though. Uh, in, in fact, if you've got something interesting to say, if you have something interesting, to say, please come along and listen to the station's broadcasts and to come into the chat room as well. Subscribe to the archives. Do what you can to support the station. It is listener funded. You can also click on the uh, ads for the sponsors. Some interesting products there. The Nighthawk himself, if you believe it or not, this has uh, it's got some uh, fantastic skills. Um, he's an excellent woodworker, is I have to awesome. say. Um, if I could import him into, into Australia, uh, I'll actually I'll look into it. But at this point, it's difficult to get anything uh, organic into Australia, even um, the woodwork stuff that has yeah. been uh, treated. But he's it stays so in, awesome. It stays in me, quarantine his forever. Is mm. Unbelievable. It's well good. Well done, right? no, I completely agree. It's, it's true. Yeah, 100%. Okay, so... Yeah, this station is uh, exists well, really only to to, to uh, give uh, people that have a different opinion a platform. Uh, I think and then bring people uh, maybe different organizations globally that own close to ninety um, percent of all media outlets. <clears throat> you know, that's that's print media, that's television, that's that's it's uh, movies, it's uh, internet news as well now. So it's a whole bunch of only owned by six corporations, and and, and we are not. Or, or, well, the revolution that radio is not. Um, so yeah, if you can, please do. Uh, we are talking about the missing years of Jesus. I just uh, told our esteemed listenership, Dave. I uh, used to create the dubious Facebook page. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the thing now. Come and join. We're gonna be a movement to be. Oh, no way! What? Uh, Okay, sorry, I have to say this. There is already a Möbius Strip Earth Society no. on Facebook. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. Oh, man, I yeah, I think I'm so smart. Uh, um, but someone else has completely trumped me. Okay, well, there goes that idea. I'm going to think of something else. Uh, but we are talking about... I can't believe it. Uh, we're talking about the uh, missing years of Jesus, and the uh, last time we shared it with you, uh, the travel uh, uh, account of a journalist that went, went into Kashmir, um, into Srinagar to be specific. Uh, this is uh, Sam Miller, he, he wrote this uh, piece, and he had just gone to, to the tomb, the alleged tomb of Jesus. Uh-huh. Quite famous now on Lonely Planet. He tried to India and listens, uh, listed uh, as, as a place to go to. And uh, to Sam here, it was just as well. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, the, yeah, so it, it was just, it became another thing to, to visit, right? That's what Sam tells us. Says, oh, Jesus was just another place to take off on the tourist in India. Must visit list. Famous meeting, though. The, the, the ruins of a Buddhist monastery in a spectacular location halfway up a mountain. Uh, at North Srinagar are not yet mentioned in the Lonely Planet. It's a spot that uh, Sam had uh, previously been. As a senior police officer told him, and with terrorists, but the watchmen now seem prepared for the words of English and his hidden stock of ancient terracotta tiles for sale. He informed him. That is, that Jesus was among the religious leaders who attended the famous Buddhist AD 80. So, just 80 years after our calendar began. And 
Sorry to name it gullible tourist. They date back to the 19th century. They were a part of attempts to explain the striking similarities between Buddhism. A matter of great concern to 19th century scholars, and also a desire among some Christians to root the story of Jesus in Indian in, in, having a Jewish heritage. Now, like, just let's, I have to uh, break here for a second to, to uh, explain what, what this means. And so, Jesus was, was a Jew, he was born into a Jewish family, and was raised in the Jewish faith in. in uh, Judea at the time, right? So they or Palestine at the time, um, and then he then goes to to reform, or at least it seems he wants to reform the Judaism uh, of his time. He wants to reform it. He wants to bring it into the <laughs> into the first century, I guess. Um, but um, it, it was it was an effort to to um, to reform. That's why I was upset the way that. His way of, of thinking, which was completely 180 degrees different from the Old Testament. Old Testament, I for New Testament presents the other cheek. If one strikes you on the left cheek, present to him the right cheek so he may strike you again. Love your enemy. Complete turnabout as far as, as, as that uh, religious teaching, eye for an eye, <laughs> really eye for an eye. In fact, <clears throat> a lot of the um, uh, 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 laws are still fairly um, harsh in that regard, and in some of the conventions as well. Um, but it is, it is it's, it's a very uh, 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 horrific read, if you take, you take the time to read the Old Testament. Read it, read it, see what happens. The New Testament is a completely different story. Jesus the personification of love and forgiveness and understanding and tolerance and all of those wonderful things, right? Trying to, trying to help us get out of this this uh, horrible place. To heaven is through me, he says. Right. Now, that Buddha, that whole thinking that Jesus brought to the Middle East and trying to reform Judaism is. Buddhist, okay, if the Buddhism, Taoism, and similar offsprings, that's exactly what they preach. That's exactly the kind of life lessons they're trying to teach us. So it is no surprise that people looked at Christianity and Jesus and his teaching and thought, hey, that looks a lot like Buddhism, because it is. It, right? With the obvious, the obvious um, the difference now in modern times. Now, that, that clearly that um, Christians believe that Jesus is the Son of God and the others to the Father is through the Son. So, but that's not really, you know, the, 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 the fundamental of the teaching. The fundamental of the teaching is love, forgiveness, and self-sacrifice. got lost in the messaging there, right? I don't know if you've been to the Vatican or any, any cathedral. Any, any Catholic cathedral anywhere in the world, you, you will be or over the collection of artifacts and gold and, and Versace-like stylings than that. It's, it's quite breathtaking, to, to, to uh, put it mildly. The, the wealth concentrated into the Catholic Church is staggering. The Catholic Church were to preach. And I'm, I'm picking on the Catholics specifically because they are the they claim direct lineage from Peter, one of the apostles of Jesus, right? Fills the position of, of Peter. Um, so, you know, so I, I pick on them. But if, if there were a tenet of, of poverty, like Jesus lived in poverty and such, you know, and, you know, we should give to God what's God's and to Rome what's Rome's. He was referring to tax payments and money, right? God is not interested in money. He doesn't give a hoot about it. I mean, the Caesar is, the, you know, the emperor. He wants his gold. So pay him, pay him taxes, yeah. But nothing to do with God. Um, but yeah, so if, if they were to adhere to a vow of poverty, and if I, yeah, not saying that interested parties to museums, national trusts, and all that wonderful stuff, hundreds of billions of dollars would be raised. More, more. Because some of the things are clearly priceless. Um, and guess what? It would 
be a gigantic step towards erasing poverty and, and uh, hunger in the world. I guarantee it. Okay, so just, just, okay. So, right. And all the missing years, the missing years. My, what do the missing years tell us? Uh, page seven. <laughs> seven. All these, seven. So, oh, I will. No, and it's okay. Oh, okay, I'm, you go ahead. <laughs> okay, so the famous meeting. The ruins of a Buddhist monastery in a spectacular location halfway up the mountainside north of, north of Srinagar are not yet mentioned in The Lonely Planet. Remember from last week, The Lonely Planet reference caused a place to be closed and shut down because people decided to start taking pieces of it. It's a spot that I, and the writer, had previously been unable to visit because of a senior police officer told me it was infested with terrorists. But the watchman now seems prepared for the arrival of mass tourism with his 50 words of English we, and his we, hideous... We had the missing... What? Miss, missing years, Dave. Missing, we had the missing years. <laughs> No, Listen, we're not. Listen, we're, from, yes, from, from, we last, from last week. Oh, we're down there. Did you read that bit? Yeah, right? I already shared that. Oh, did you? Oh, that's great. Uh, Fantastic. I, did, I, did. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, huh? I, good. You, you, your audio is a bit broken up, so I, I, I didn't really get the context. I thought you were just talking about stuff. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. That's all right. The missing that's years. There is talk of the missing years of Jesus unmentioned in the Gospels when he was between the ages of 12 and 30. Some say, this sounds like Top Gear, some say he was in India, he's the stick, picking up Buddhist ideas. These aren't notions that have entirely died out. The US-based Christian sect known as the Church Universal and Triumphant, I'd never heard of them, but now they're out there, is the best known modern supporter of the belief that Jesus lived in Kashmir. Oh, that's, they're probably trying to, all this, all this fighting is probably over that. Though they don't believe he died there. And in Islam, in which Jesus is the penultimate prophet, that's the second best prophet, or the second last, there is also a minority tradition adopted by the controversial um, Adia sect that Rosabal does contain the graves of, grave of Jesus. Professional historians tend to laugh out loud when you mention that the notion that Jesus might have lived in Kashmir, but his tomb is now firmly on the tourist trail. And a growing number of credulous visitors believe that he was buried in Rosabal Shrine, what we mentioned last week. And for those who scoff, remember that others have argued, just as implausibly, that Jesus came to Britain. A theory that was much in vogue when the poet William Blake famously asked the question in an and I quote, And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green? And was the holy lamb of God on England's pleasant pastures seen? I can't help it. I get all biblical when I read that. That's a good question. And the number of the counting of the counting shall be three. No more. Not four, two, not no three. No less. <laughs> four. That's three. No more. Six is right out. <laughs> oh, the holy hand grenade of Antioch. Uh, I can't help it. I, I go to that place, Becky. You know I go there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but look, look Becky, you, you've got to tell us all about Jesus in India. Um, this brings us to... Uh, the treaty is written by Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, the founder of the Ahmadiyya movement in 1899, so over 100 years ago. As we said earlier, um, Christians at the time found it troubling that uh, uh, 
Christianity so much in common with Buddhism. The treatise, which was then published as a book, puts forward the of Judea and migrated eastward in order to continue his mission to the lost tribes of Israel, traveling through Persia and Afghanistan and eventually dying a natural and honorable death in Kash at an old age. A Ghulam Ahmad applied textual analysis of both the Gospels and Islamic sources, the Quran and Hadith, and also drew upon medical and historical material, including what he claimed were ancient Buddhist records to our modern scholars such as Snorklat, Refuge. Oh, you break it up. So, there's mis misery of material unrelated. So, what's the background here? The book was completed in 1890, partly serialized in the Review of Religion 902 to 903. It was published in book form shortly after death in 1908. The first complete English translation was published in 1944. Now, what's the content going to tell us? The treatise, the book, that is, suggests that Jesus, having survived crucifixion, discreetly left Roman jurisdiction for the East, starting his journey from Jerusalem and passing, sorry, passing through Nisibis and Persia, eventually reaching Afghanistan, where he met the Israeli tribes who, after they escaped from the bonds of Nebuchadnezzar, Centuries from they traveled to Kashmir, where some Israel tribes had also settled and lived there until his death at an old age. <clears throat> Other authors have suggested that the resemblance between Buddhist and Christian teachings and between the lives of Jesus and Buddha, as recorded in their respective scriptures, indicate that Buddhist teaching that Buddhist teachings must reach Palestine. It's not actually that, that unbelievable been incorporated by Jesus into his own teaching, or that he must have traveled to India pre-crucifixion. We got 18 years to do that, so possibly. Gula Ahmad, however, asserts that Jesus reached in India only after the crucifixion, and that Buddhists reproduced the Gospels and their scriptures. He argues that Jesus also preached to Buddhist monks, some of whom were originally Jews, who accepted him as a manifestation of the Buddha, the promised teacher, and mingled his teachings with Buddhas. Jesus in India also contains claims of whereabouts of the lost tribes of Israel, suggesting that these tribes were scattered throughout Afghanistan, Kashmir, and western China. It also provides a list of tribes of these regions seeking to trace their Israelite, Israelite roots. David? Uh, just checking. There we go. I'm not muted any longer. Okay. Alleged discovery. Ahmadiyya literature states that one of the Gulman Ahmad's disciples, Khalifa Nuruddin or Nur al Din of Jalapur Jatan district, Jurat, Pakistan, or Gurat, spoke to him about a tomb in Srinagar that was said to be the tomb of a prophet named Yuz Asav. Ghulam Ahmad instructed him to do some further research into the matter. Nurdin went to Srinagar and stayed there for about four months. He collected information and also obtained the signatures of 556 inhabitants who attested that, according to their traditions, the remains of Jesus lay in the Rosa Bowl. He also brought back a sketch of the Rosa Bowl. Thereafter, Gulman Ahmad decided to send one of his followers, Malvi Abdullah, to Kashmir to investigate this tomb. Malvi arrived in Kashmir, conducted his investigations, and wrote back to Gulman about his findings. Gulman then published a poster that contained Mulvey's letter as well as Mulvey's sketch of Rosa Bowl. Gulman began studying the local traditions of the people of Kashmir, both oral and written, and discovered that these traditions, as mentioned in the letter from Mulvey, referred to Rosa Bowl as the tomb of Nabi Issa, a prophet, the prophet Jesus. According to this information, the Muslims in that locality did not believe Jesus to be in heaven 
as was taught by the Orthodox clergy, the Ahmadiyya publication, publication, Review of Religions, recorded this belief in October, in its October 1909 edition. Mekki. Oh, I suppose I could go... Modern... Going. Modern. Yeah. Oh, keep going, yeah. Alright, so modern reception. I didn't realise it was the end of the story. The claims of the book regarding a journey of Jesus to India are rejected by scholars. Remember, they're locked arms. Locked step. Can't all... If, they, if anyone disagrees, they don't go forward. The documents used by Ahmed were received by the German Indologist Gunther Gronbold in Jesus in Indian. Das Eind, end, Ende Eine Legend, um, Munich 1985, with Gronbold concluding that Ahmed had misidentified material from the Bralam and Josephat text relating to Christianized versions of the life of Siddhartha, um, Gautama, not of Jesus. They're saying he made a mistake. Another German scholar, Norbert Klart, in Lebde, Jesus in Indian, Indian uh, 1988, examined the same Muslim and Christian sources text and came to the same conclusion as Gronbold. There you go, Mickey. It's all up to you. Jesus in India. Jesus in India. Um, this is a book written by Holger Kirsten, and I'm quoting here from it. It is simply of vital importance to find again the path to the sources, to the, the eternal and central truth of Christ's message, which has been shaken almost beyond recognition by the profane ambitions of more or less secular institutions, arrogating to themselves a religious authority. This is an attempt to open a way to a new future firmly founded in the true spiritual and religious sources of the past, says the Kirk. And thus begins Holger Kirsten's book, <clears throat> Jesus Lived in India. This German book is a thorough, methodical, and authoritative examination of the evidence of Christ's life beyond the Middle East, before the crucifixion, and in India and elsewhere after it. Not what I'm saying, what the text is saying. Not we all have opinions. This article, <clears throat> which we found, <clears throat> is a summary of Kirsten's exhaustive research into Christ's travels after the crucifixion. His arrival in India with the mother Mary, and finally his death and entombment in Kashmir. Kirsten notes the many parallels of Christ's teachings with other religions and cultural traditions, and suggests that at least some of these figures may have been one and the same personality. Now, before I go any further, there are two, obviously, there are two sides to the story. One, the one side that believes that's all nonsense, Jesus never went to India, never survived the crucifixion, never went to India before or after the crucifixion. And then the other side that believes he did, either before or after or both. Um, this is a fundamental difference in belief. Right? It really tests you because, and this is really important, if Jesus did not die at the crucifixion, the entire Christian faith is going to fall apart. Ooh, that's a big statement. Mm. The fundamental tenet of the Christian religion is that Jesus Christ, sent by his Father, died at the cross for our sins. His blood washed away our sins, including the original sin committed by Adam and Eve and all that stuff, blah, 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 whatever. If that's not true, if Jesus did not die, in fact, at, at, on the cross, he then also was not resurrected and, uh, you know, manifested into heaven. None, none of that happened. The, the entire basis for the Christian religion, as we know today, the last 2,000 years, and I'm not saying it's, it's this way or that way, falls apart. So we should not be surprised that people will strongly argue against anything like this, from everything, because it would completely invalidate Christianity as it exists today. Because if, if Jesus Christ did not die on the cross, then what happened? I mean, what's what happened to us? Washed them away, and why, you know, we didn't die from So, just the argument, okay? I need, I'm not saying that's what I believe, I'm saying that's what the argument is. 
These are the two fundamentally opposing viewpoints which can never be reconciled. Impossible. It's like the Palestinians and the uh, Israelis wanting to have Jerusalem for the capital. Both of them can't mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. They can't both. They can't both have it. Can cannot be done. This is the same. Okay, so, so it's a Venn diagram. No, it's not. It's not a... <laughs> That's exactly right. It's not. So, uh, if you don't know what it means, you should look it up. Um, but but the point is that that you need to understand it. But this is not what the shiny side is saying. The shiny side out is not saying this. The shiny side is not saying that he died, and the shiny side out is not saying that he did not die. What we are presenting you are opposing points of view, and you, mm -hmm. you make minds. What most people will believe. They will believe whatever it was they believed before we started talking about this. <laughs> okay, that's what most people will go back to. No, that's yeah. what it is. It's, it's human nature. It makes no it makes no difference, right? But I, I I do like to think that some some of you out there might might think about this and go, oh, this is interesting. And at this point you can start your own Mobius Strip Earth Facebook page. No, but you, you can then do go go into your version. Yeah. See what happened. Trump by someone else did it for you. Oh, maybe you it. And it is not possible. I, I'm concerned. This enterprise went to India. It's true. It's hard to prove or well, disprove a negative. The current information documented in Christ's life is restricted to the Gospels and the work of church. One can hardly obvious interest in maintaining the authority of the church. And its grip on the masses. That's a true point. That's a good point. So, we, so nobody can prove that Jesus didn't go to India. Nobody can prove that positively. Okay, because there are 18 years. I mean, it doesn't take that long to get to India from the Middle East, even by foot. The Russian scholar Notovich was the first that Christ may have gone to India. In 1887, so predating uh, uh, Ahmad by about uh, 12 years, Notovich, a Russian scholar and Orientalist, arrived in Kashmir during one of several journeys to the Orient. At the Zojila Pass, Notovich was a guest in a Buddhist monastery, where a monk told him of the Botsavata saint called Issa. Now, I'm going to pause here for a second again. Jesus is the Romanized name of someone of Jewish descent, which we think may be Yeshu or Yeshua or Yosh. So Jesus is not a Roman word, okay? It's actually or Yosh, maybe Isa or Aisha or Isaac, okay? So his name was Roman, okay? As time went on. So we don't know exactly what his name was. We think it might have been Yeshu or, or Yoshu. But Isa is certainly uh, another variant of that name. Right? Jesus is the Romanized form, and Isa may have been the um, Central Asian uh, version of the name that he had, be it Yoshu or Isha. And not of which was stunned by the remarkable parallel. Teachings and crucifixion. For about 16 years, Christ traveled through Turkey, Persia, Western Europe, and possibly England. We'll get to that in a second. He finally arrived with Mary in a place near Kashmir, where she died. After many years in Kashmir, teaching to an appreciative population who venerated him as a great prophet, reformer, and saint, he was buried in a tomb in Kashmir itself. The first first step in Christ's trail after the crucifixion is found in the Persian scholar F. Muhammad's work Jami Ut Tuvarik, which tells of Christ's arrival in the kingdom of Nisibis by royal invitation. Nisibis is today known as Nusaybin in Turkey. This is reiterated in the Imam Abu Jafar Muhammad's Tafsi ibn i Jamar at Tubri. Um, and there's no further translation of that. Kirsten found that in both Turkey and Persia, there are ancient stories of a saint called Yus Asaf, leader of the healed, Yus Asaf, whose behavior, miracles, and teachings are remarkably similar to that of Christ. The many Islamic and Hindu historical works recording local history and legends of kings, noblemen, and saints of the areas thought to be traveled by Jesus also give evidence of a Christ-like man. The Quran, for example, refers to Christ as Isa, 
are Isar. Further east, the Kurdish tribes of eastern Anatolia have several stories describing Christ's stay in eastern Turkey after his resurrection. Not by the theological community, like we have found with most of the uh, local lords, uh, they simply ignore it. Kirsten all he may have been exposed after his birth in Bethlehem. Avoid Herod's persecution, but that's actually in the New Testament. They ran away because Herod, paranoid and not wanting to be displaced by a child, had all the all the well the male children uh, killed. You know um, that fit the description back in the day. So so uh, Joseph and, and Mary fled. And fled. Well, let us now acknowledge that book probably existed in Alexandria long before the Christian. That's surprising, but you know, more close. Now, the Apocrypha text said to have been written by the apostles, but which are not officially accepted by the church. Indeed, the church regards them as heresy, since the substantial amount of the Apocrypha directly contradicts church dogma and theology. The apocryphal Acts of Thomas, for example, tell how Christ met Thomas several times after the crucifixions. In fact, they tell us how Christ sent Thomas to teach his spirituality in India. This is corroborated by found in the form of stone inscriptions at Fatehpur, Sikri, near the Taj Mahal in northern India. They include Agrafa, which are sayings of Christ that don't exist in the mainstream Bible. Their grammatical form is most similar to that of the ap apocryphal Gospel of Thomas. This is but one example giving credibility to the idea that texts not recognized by the Church hold important clues about Christ's true life and his teachings. In tracing Christ's movements to India and beyond, Carson also discovered that many teachings, which have been gradually edited out of the modern Bible, were original principles such as karma and reincarnation, for example, were common knowledge then and seem to have been reaffirmed by Christ. I'm going to pause here for a second. We know reincarnation. That's the thing. I'm going right back into the text. Imagine the that, sorry, that this discovery holds for Western Christianity. Christ in the doctrinal top pockets and have constrained the entire world to the narrow teachings of blind faith, organized religion, of original sin. Further clues are cited from the Epigraphal Acts of Thomas and the Gospel of Thomas, which are of Syrian origin, have been dated to the 4th century AD. All possible, they are, sorry, they are Gnostic scriptures, and despite the evidence indicating their authenticity, they are not given credence by mainstream theologians. In these texts, Thomas tells of Christ's appearance in Andropolis, Paphlogenia, today known as the extreme north of Anatolia, as a guest of the king of Andropa. There he met with Thomas, who had arrived separately. Dave? I had to unmute. It is Andropolis that Christ entreated Thomas to go to India to begin spreading his teachings. <coughs> It seems that Christ and Mary then moved along the west coast of Turkey. Proof of this could be an old stopping place for travellers called the Home of Mary, found along the ancient Silk Route. From here, Christ could easily have entered Europe via France. He may have even travelled as far as the British Isles, for in England there is an ancient oak tree called the Hallowed tree which says local legend was planted by christ himself in his travels through persia that's iran today by the way christ became known as yuz asaf leader of the yield that means we know this because of kashmiri historical document confirms that isa the Quranic name for Christ was in fact also known as Yusuf Asaf. The Jami Uf Tamarak, volume 2, tells Yus Asaf visited um, Maslij, 
where he attended the grave of Shem, Noah's son. There are all, uh, various other accounts, such as Aga Mustas, Awali uh, Shai E Paras, tell that the sorry that tell of Yusasov's travels nice. and teachings all over Persia. It seems that Yusasov blessed Afghanistan and Pakistan with his presence also. There are, for example, two plains in eastern Afghanistan near Ghazni and uh, Galalabad bearing the name of the Prophet himself, Yuz Asaf. Again, the ap apocryphal Acts of Thomas. Thomas says that he and Christ attended the, ch the court of King Gandafor of Taxila. Now it's called Pakistan. In about 470, sorry, well, it's only 47 AD. And that eventually both the king and his brother accepted Christ's teachings. Kirsten claims that there are more than 21 historical documents that bear witness to the existing of existence of Christ in Kashmir, where he was known also as Yus Afa, Asaf and Issa. For example, oh, you're going to have to do this one, Meki. The Bahavishyat Mahapurana. Thank you very much. Volume 9, verses 17 through 32, contains an account of Issa, Missa, uh, Jesus of Messiah, uh, Messiah, sorry, Jesus the Messiah. It describes Christ's arrival in Kashmir region of India and his encounter with King Shalivana Hana. I put an extra A in there. Who rules Kushan? He's not going to have any problem with that. Kushan area. This is 39 to 50 AD. <laughs> and who entertained Christ as a guest for some time. Christ's life in India after the crucifixion challenges current church teachings at their very foundation. Now, we respectfully understand what that means. The theology of St. Paul, the, ma the major influence on modern Christianity, is empty fanaticism in the light of this discovery. Meki. The historian Mullah Nadim in 1413 also recounts the story of Yusasaf, sorry, Yusasaf who was a contemporary to King Gobatada, and confirms that he also used the name Issa, uh, which means Jesus, of course. There's also much history historical truth in the towns and the villages of northern India to prove that Jesus and his mother spent time in the area. For instance, at the border of a small town called Mari, M-A-R-I, or Mary, there is nearby a mountain called Pindi Point, upon which is an old tomb called um, or the final resting place of Mary. The tomb is said to be very old and local Muslims venerated as the grave of Isa's mother. And Isa again yeah, synonymous with Christ. The tomb itself is oriented east-west, consistent with the Jewish tradition, despite the fact that it is within a Muslim area. <clears throat> Assuming it's, again, Jew, <laughs> Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. Okay, just... <laughs> she was born. Um, now, let's go back to the text. Assuming it's an antiquity, such a tomb could not be Hindu either, since the Hindu temporary to Christ, cremate and scattered their ashes, as do Hindus today. So there are actually no Hindu cemeteries. You might uh, be aware of that. Trail into Kashmir, of Srinagar, between the villages of Nauga, uh, the man of South, again, this is uh, assumed to be Jesus. Then there is the sacred building called Aish Mukam, 60 kilometers southeast of Srinagar and 12 kilometers from Bish Bihara. Aish, says Kirsten, is the Issa and Mukam place of rest or repose. Moses' rod or the Jesus rod, which local legend says belonged to Moses himself. Christ is said to also have held it, uh, perhaps to confirm his. Above the town of Srinagar is a temple known as the throne, which dates back to at least 1000 BC. 
uh, which King Gobadatta had restored at about the same time. The restoration was done by a Persian architect who personally left four inscriptions on the side steps of the temple. The third and fourth inscription read the following. At this time, Yus Asaf announced his prophetic calling in year 50 and 4. And he is Jesus, prophet of the sons of Israel. And if true, this could be a powerful confirmation of Kirsten's theory. Kirsten suggests that Christ may have traveled to the south of India also, finally returning to Kashmir to die at the age of approximately 80 years. Christ's tomb, says Kirsten, lies in Srinagar's old town in a building called Rosabal. Rosabal is an abbreviation of Rausa Baal, meaning tomb of a prophet. At the entrance, there's an inscription explaining that Yus Asaf is buried along with another Muslim saint. Both have grey stones which are oriented in north-south direction, according to Muslim tradition. However, through a small opening, the true burial chamber can be seen in which there's a sarcophagus of Yus Asaf in east-west, which is the Jewish orientation. According to Professor Hasnain, who has studied there are footprints on the gravestones have been closely examined, carved images of a crucifix and a rosary. The footprints of Yus Asaf have what appear to be scars represented on both feet, if one assumes that they are crucifixion scars, and their position is consistent with the scars shown in the Turin Shroud. Nailed over right. Getting into old territory here. Crucifixion was not practiced in Asia, so it is quite possible that they were inflicted elsewhere, such as the Middle East. The tomb is called by some as Hazrat Isa Shahi, or Tomb of the Lord Master Jesus. If you, if you accept that Isa is a form of Jesus. Ancient records acknowledge the existence of the tomb as long ago as 112 AD. So it's been there for a while. The Grand Mufti, a prominent Muslim cleric himself, has confirmed that Hazrat Isa Sahib is indeed the tomb of Yus Asaf. Thus, Kirsten deduces that the tomb of Jesus himself is in Kashmir. Every monumental Christ's life in India after the crucifixion challenges current church teachings at the of St. Paul, the major influence of modern Christianity, as we said earlier, is empty fanaticism in the light of this discovery. Threatened of obedience to the church, original sin, salvation through blind faith, and the non existence of reincarnation, etc., etc. Yet, these ideas underlie the morality and ethics or lack of them, that govern the entire Western society. From the legal system to medical health, care schemes and onwards. It is no wonder that the modern churches in the secular interest refuse to consider such a proposition as Kirsten's. Okay, now the synopsis of Jesus Lift in India, which we've just shared with you by Holger Kirsten, was written by Dr. Ramesh Manoka and Anna Potts. And you can download it at www.soul.com.au slash core slash seven underscore zero one. Uh, but it's all part of the show notes. So this is now you you as we as we shared with you earlier, there was a great uh, deal of debunking going on. We shared with you that you know that these 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 uh, theories are all being completely discounted by uh, by mainstream. Um, So I told her Kirsten was mentioned in the very first time, the last week's first show. Um, but now we've given you some more detail of it. And I, uh, I mean, look, if you're interested, read the book. You know, the book to follow up on his research. Uh, see, see if it's all true or false. If, if true, it, it certainly uh, is a monumental thing. But no less monumental, I guess, in some ways than the um, sentencing of, of, of the cardinal of the Catholic church to uh, we've seen in Australia, the third most powerful person. The gag order is gone, we can talk about it, but the third most powerful personage in the it's completely unheard of. It is it is a, it's something that that is astounding. Unfortunately, it looks like Mickey's got some audio problems. 
I know he's going to hear this in a second. But uh, I mean, can you hear me okay? Yeah, sort of. Look, no. your audio became a little patchy, and it's been we've really missed, okay. We, yeah, but we've missed a couple of words here and there, and it's there's been some gaps, but it usually catches up, and it's it's not oh. terrible. But sorry, uh, sorry about that. Yeah, apologies to everyone. <laughs> yeah, and um, by uh, which brings us to the next text, uh, Dave, uh, tracing the post-crucifixion footsteps of uh, that was written in March 2012. Not a problem. All right. If Jesus Christ survived the crucifixion as a crucifixion, as a mortal human being, then he was not resurrected and he did not ascend to heaven. Then what ultimately became of him is the question. One of the key missions of the Jewish Messiah was to gather all the tribes of Israel and to help unite them once more in the land of Israel. Jesus had declared in his vision, and I quote, And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. I said flock, one shepherd. If Jesus was to truly fulfill his mission, he would have uh, he would have to find and preach to these tribes. Whilst the identity of these tribes and their current whereabouts is unclear, a number of researchers have concluded that a section of the modern day Afghans descended from these tribes. The evidence comes from facial similarities, linguistics, names of people, places, oral traditions. As we piece together the fragments of information we have about Jesus' life after the crucifixion, the compelling research suggests that having arrived, or sorry, survived the crucifixion, Jesus Christ journeyed towards the east in search of the lost tribes of Israel, who, as is proven from historical sources, had become scattered and dispersed towards the east in many hundreds of years previous to this event uh, to his advent sorry not the event the conclusion we arrive at is that jesus christ delivered his message to these dispersed israelite communities ultimately reaching kashmir where his tomb exists to this day a growing group of esteemed researchers and writers of different religious beliefs have all argued that the final resting place of Jesus is in Srinagar, Kashmir. The tomb is locally known as Rosabal, which we have mentioned before in another story, meaning the honoured tomb. And local traditions, traditions state the inhabitant of the tomb was a prophet from a foreign land. The idea that Jesus travelled to India is buried in the Rosabal, challenges to commonly held belief among Christians and Muslims that Jesus rose to heaven. Yet, we find Rosabal Tomb the subject of books by Christian authors such as American journalist and author Suzanne Olson and some Muslim authors such as Dr. Frida uh, Hasnain, a prior, prominent Sufi archaeologist and professor of history. Olsen and Dr. Hasnain have each written several books on the topic, the most recent of which, The Rosa Baal, The Tomb of Jesus, is a collaboration between the two experts. Authors belonging to faith traditions that initially appear to have no direct link with Jesus Christ have also written in favour of this theory. Over the last 20 years, there have been books written by Mantoche Devi, Devi, a Sikh author, Ashwin Sanghi, an Indian Hindu novelist, Holger Kirsten, a German Buddhist, as well as Anand Krishna, an interfaith spiritualist. I've never heard that term interfaith. These authors approach the topic of Jesus' post-crucifixion travels in the East from a different perspective. 
yet all agree on the Roosevelt tomb as the final resting place for Jesus Christ. Documentaries on this subject have also been featured on the BBC, the Discovery Channel, and the Sudan's Channel. Mackie, what's the post-crucifixion Jesus clues in the Holy Bible? Channel Sunday. Audio problems. Um, yep. Um, there we go. Jesus. We can suppose. Can you not hear? You can't hear me. We can hear. Hello. Testing. Much testing. Better, better now. Testing. Okay. Testing. One two. Okay. If Jesus had survived the crucifixion, we can suppose that his first priority would have been to escape the danger of being captured once more. The biblical texts clearly talk of Jesus meeting his disciples in secret and also being on the move. The Gospel of Matthew records that the disciples are being specifically instructed by Jesus to leave Jerusalem and meet him in Galilee. In the post-crucifixion sightings of Jesus Christ in the Gospels, it often takes time for those he meets with, rather, to recognize him. Could Jesus have been in some form of disguise? In the famous narrative uh, talking of the risen Jesus appearing to Mary Magdalene, it is interesting to note that Mary initially mistakes him for the gardener. Later on the road to Emmaus, he is not recognized until he breaks bread. This is a very specific way he broke bread. The behavior of Jesus in these accounts is consistent with someone who is traveling incognito, trying to avoid drawing attention to himself. This would only make sense if the case was that Jesus remained alive and had survived crucifixion and needed to avoid further persecution. The last mention of Jesus appearing to someone in the New Testament is Paul's recollection of Jesus uh, talking to him on the road to Damascus, and that's really famous. In fact, uh, Paul was Saul, or Saulus, uh, before that uh, fateful day on the road to Damascus, and he he was uh, struck (coughs) by a sudden inside and became Paul, and one of the most fervent proponents of uh, Christ's message. And he's, uh, well, I mean, all the letters that preach in the New Testament, all Paul's letters to Greek cities, or Greek, Greek Christian communities in Greek cities, all his letters. Um, so, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. So that's actually from the Bible, in case you're wondering. The road to the bus is very, very, probably the linchpin of, of Christianity. If, if uh, Saul had not had his blinding insight, Christianity probably wouldn't have gotten off the ground the way we know it today. <clears throat> Was this a vision or a physical appearance? A physical appearance in Damascus would be consistent with Jesus' reported travels, those moving from Jerusalem northwards. Now, we don't have um, any more time to go into, into other, any other texts here. Uh, suffice it to say, there's a bit more material we have to cover next time. Um, but again, this is just, this is, these are just points that we present to you. The, we're not presenting you a point of view. We're only presenting you with viewpoints of other people. What you believe, what you want to believe, what you can believe is ultimately up to you. But please um, look at some of these things and examine them critically and see what you think. You know, because this is one of the fundamental questions of Western civilization here. Okay. Did Jesus Christ survive the crucifixion? That's a really, really important question for our civilization. It really is. Because a lot of the stuff that we are, the way we think, what has shaped us in our history over the last 2,000 years, hinges, hinges on that belief that, in fact, Jesus did die on the cross. There wouldn't have been any crusades. There wouldn't be a Middle Eastern problem today. There would be a very different landscape in the world if Christianity hadn't took, taken hold the way it did. Mm. Okay? And then ask things of the church, which, which are true, which are not. I mean, why are certain uh, excluded from the Bible? Why does the church ignore certain uh, writings? Well, they disagree with the uh, 
the accepted dogma is the reason, of course. But who decided what the accepted dogma became? And is the accepted dogma in line with the teachings of Christ? Look, that's all the time we have. Donate if you can, please, and dial in next time. Same time, same bad channel. <laughs> and stay tuned for a Jair Bears roundtable. Join in, become part of the information. Take care, everyone. See you next week. Thank <music> you.